Welcome to Voices from the Valley, a podcast of the Community Foundation for the Fox Valley Region. I'm Amy Spreeman. And I'm Carolyn DeRosier. What happens when we uncover lost stories and tell them in new ways? And how might shared experiences between people who are different from one another bring us closer together? In today's very special episode, we're going to take you back to a story that happened over 50 years ago. It's the story of an exchange of black and white high school students in Wisconsin in 1966, right in the middle of the civil rights movement. Black students from Rufus King High School in Milwaukee switched places with white students from Kakana High School during a time of heightened racial tensions in our country and on the wave of big changes. The young people lived in each other's homes, attended classes in each other's schools, and took what they learned to the stage, performing Martin Duberman's groundbreaking play called In White America in both cities. This was the first time some of the Kakana students had ever seen a black person not on television, and it was the first time the black students from Milwaukee had ever lived in a small, all-white town in central Wisconsin. It's a story that was almost forgotten— But thankfully, it's being remembered in a profound and lasting way. And it's all thanks to journalist and filmmaker Joanne Williams, who one day in 2016 happened to be cleaning out her garage when she found a box marked high school stuff. In it was a copy of her high school paper from 1966, and the headline read, King is to host Kakana. Joanne remembered the exchange as she had been a student at Rufus King when it all took place. She wondered about what happened to the students in the exchange and what their lives were like now, and was inspired to embark on a six-year journey to create the documentary film, which actually involved a revival of the play 50 years later by a new generation of high school students in Milwaukee and Kakana. That's right, Amy. And the finished film is called The Exchange in White America, Kakana and King, 50 Years Later. During Black History Month, over 1,000 people in the Fox Valley area had the chance to view the film and participate in conversations with the filmmaker as part of a Northeast Wisconsin premiere tour. Let's listen to some audio from the film's trailer. I think in 1966, the black population of Kokona was one. It's really hard to know who's a good guy and who's a bad guy. They were very brave to say, yes, we're going to do this. Where is Kokona? And how far up north is Kokona? They want to, you know, go out and meet you, but they, they're sort of afraid. The impact of the experience of the exchange on the people who were involved stayed with them their whole life. I believe it's something that happened in Wisconsin that, that nobody knows about and, unless they were involved in it, but everybody should know about it because it's a way for people to get to know each other and a way for people to learn to live with each other. To talk about In White America as a work of literature that has an impact upon your life, that was important. There is a lot more change need to come, need to come, should come. You know, when they say joy comes in the morning, it need to come now. The Community Foundation was really proud to help coordinate and sponsor the premiere tour, and I actually had the opportunity to moderate a panel discussion at the Fox Cities PAC screening with the filmmaker Joanne and Paula Vandehey, whose father, Thomas Schaefer, actually started the exchange at Kakana High School when he was a teacher there, as well as Amy Zhang, a current English teacher at Kakana High School who helped revive the exchange in 2018. We thought you'd like to hear their stories, so we're bringing you our recording of the panel discussion in today's episode. Enjoy! (laughs) Stories are powerful. When I told my mom, who is here tonight, <laughs> about the story of Kakana and King and the exchange, it reminded her of a story from her high school newspaper. You see, my mom grew up in Milwaukee. She graduated from Milwaukee's James Madison High School in 1976. And in the February issue of the Madison Messenger, the lead article reads, 
Milwaukee schools ordered to desegregate. I read on to learn that it took over 10 years for a judge to rule on a suit filed in 1965 that Milwaukee schools were unconstitutionally segregated. Until that moment, it had never occurred to me that my mom spent her formative years in segregated schools. What was that like? I ignorantly thought that school segregation ended everywhere in the 60s. And in some places it did, but not here in Wisconsin. So we're going to start the discussion tonight with a bit of each of our panelists' stories. Tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, where you grew up, and how you're connected to the story of the exchange. And we'll start with Joanne. Okay. Uh, well, I was uh, a student at Rufus King High School in 66 when the exchange occurred. I was not part of it. Uh, I discovered, though, in doing research on the exchange that I had been in the chorus of the play. That's why I never saw the play, <laughs> because the chorus was always off stage. So I never got to see the play. But I remembered it as In White America by Martin Duberman. That's the way it stuck in my mind. And when I started cleaning out my garage in 2016 and came across a copy of my high school newspaper that showed the picture of the kids from Kakana, and I looked at the date and it said 1966, I said, uh, it's about to tell this story. It's about time. So that's how I got started. Is that what you asked me? Yeah, no, it's perfect. <laughs> okay. And we heard all about your um, impressive career earlier as well with your introduction. So Paula, share a little bit about yourself. So I'm Paula Vandehei. Um Tom Schaefer was my father. I'm one of eight kids. That might have been why he wanted to do plays all the time, is <laughs> trying to get out of the house. But, um, so I obviously grew up in Kakana. I graduated from UW-Madison and then worked for the city of Milwaukee for two years and then the city of Appleton for 33 years. Recently graduated and now work from engineering consulting firm part-time. So yeah, my tie is one of eight children of Tom's. Um, so I grew up in Kakana. I had Mr. Schaefer his very last year teaching in Kakana. He was my high school social studies teacher. Um, I've been with the Kakana Area School District for 19 years as um, an English teacher and ELL teacher. Um, I've been the diversity club advisor at Kakana High School for the past 16 years. Um, and I kind of accidentally got involved in this in some ways. My daughter was presenting to the school board in Kakana um, the night that Joanne showed up and said, this is what this is. None of us had ever heard of it that were in the room that night. And um, a few weeks later, I didn't hear anything. So I went to Mark Derwachter and I said, what are we doing? And he said, what are you doing? And I, <laughs> and then I said, okay. And then I got a hold of Joanne and we, we made it happen. So, yeah. I love that. Uh, Paula and Amy. What was coming up for you after seeing the film this week? How did it feel to experience the film together with the community? We'll start with you, Amy. Um, I was pleasantly surprised. I've seen the film. I was I was lucky enough to go down and, and see it prior to this, but I was so pleasantly surprised by the turnout in Kakana and so far on social media and all the things. Everybody's been so amazed and excited about it and it's just been in a really positive experience and I cannot wait to be able to show it to the students on a more mass level. I helped design the curriculum um, that we used before they presented the play and we're hoping to integrate it into our curriculum in Kakana. So hopefully. So this is my fourth time seeing the documentary <laughs> and I don't know what you guys but like my heart is still just going crazy and, and it gets better every time I see it it's amazing <laughs> but um so yeah just overwhelmed with the turnout um really proud of the number of people that showed up at Kakana High School on Monday night so really proud of that I think one takeaway I have is just I think sad that my dad could not be here to see the documentary um so just want to take one quick minute to thank Joanne on behalf of my father and our whole, the whole Schaefer family, so thank you. You're welcome.
So, Paula, thinking about your father, Thomas Schaefer, who had the idea to put on the play In White America in 1966, um, as we saw in the film, you were very young at that time, but what do you remember about your father and, and about the experience, and what were some of the reactions in Kakana to the exchange? Yes, I was three years old, um, so, <laughs> uh, but there was a couple of distinct things I remember. Um, I definitely remember my father sitting us down and just explaining that there's going to be students coming to the house and they're going to be different. And really there was that life lesson of there's differences, but there's so much commonality and they're just people, nothing to be afraid of. Well, I think you all saw Alan. He was very tall. So what I remember being a little three-year-old was not his skin color. I was like, wow, is he tall? Um, and I remember my sister Dawn, she was older, she was five. We were both sitting on my father's lap at the beginning, probably a little nervous. By the end of the night, we were on the couch with all the students, and I'm sure that they were like, yay, a bunch of, you know, a bunch of little <laughs> kids hanging out with us. But So there was definitely that starting with fear that night, and by the end of the night, just being a bunch of kids together in a house. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned the film a little bit about some of the response. It Was it both positive, negative? You know, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so I don't have like just like, memories. I think it's more of what I heard from my, our parents as we were growing up. There was, you know, not everyone wanted to see the, the play. Not everyone wanted to see the exchange. I think as the McCarty's talked about, I think mostly it was, you know, accepted. I think what happened is people were afraid, and then as it went through and everything was okay, I think it was just kind of that life lesson of, yep, you can be afraid, but try things, and you might be surprised at how they turn out. But, yeah, so I think that there was maybe even some discussion of hope Dad doesn't lose his job kind of thing, Um, but it all worked out, so... Amy, you talked a little bit about what motivated you to, to help um, launch the play again in 2018. Tell us a little bit more about that. What was the impact on your students? What was the response? So initially, I, anything diversity related, I get super excited about. So I was like, this is just another project for me. Um, but then when I got the script, because before we decided to do the exchange and bring the play up, I had to read it because I was I can't show something to the public that I haven't read. And I it startled me how little we teach black history. And the fact that a social studies teacher at the time, Michelle Van Ark, who now is in West De Pere, we had to pull it apart. And we actually had to integrate it into our curriculum immediately to teach black history because I feel like most schools in Wisconsin, we teach slavery and Dr. King and all was good in the world. Like it was, you know, like it was really sad, but it was so eye opening and, and we integrated it into the curriculum and then the students got to hear about it. And then as you heard from Ian, who's in the audience, um, he was very inspired in the diversity club kids who we have about 70 members. Um, at any given time, and they all got to experience this amazing thing and took it with them, and it was just amazing. Any recommendations, Amy, on what can we do to try to help make sure we're teaching um, inclusive history, history that represents the perspectives of all, of all people? I mean, that's essentially what I remember learning from high school, mm-hmm. which when I became an adult and learned a lot more than I was uh, rather shocked and ashamed of the things that I didn't know and didn't learn about the history, history of America. What would you recommend we do about that? Um, I think our new DPI standards with the mirrors and windows curriculum of trying to integrate more diversity city but I think too as a predominantly white field in Wisconsin we as white educators have to educate ourselves because we weren't educated so the more we can educate ourselves then the more we can bring it to our students thank you so we heard in the film from Linda Pluchek Uh, one of the exchange participants, about how shocked she was that Rufus King High School, which had a greater percentage of black students, was still very racially segregated. A painful fact we must face here in Wisconsin is that despite the growth of non-white residents in the 50-plus years since the exchange took place, we are still one of the most, if not the most, racially segregated state in America. We see evidence of persistent segregation in education, housing, infrastructure, and many other areas. Paula, you said in the film that you think your father would have envisioned something better uh, than where we're at today. 
and several of the other exchange participants question in the film this notion of progress. From each of your perspectives, what might be holding us back from racial progress? Is it conscious or unconscious bias, stereotypes, systems? Um, just to ask each of you to kind of speak to this from your various perspectives, and we'll start with Joanne. Education and information. That's what I tried to say with the film. Uh, you have to get to know people one-on-one -on -one before you can really judge them. And that's not easy to do. And you have to be open to that kind of education. And not only do you have to be open to who they are and what their family is like, but you have to be open to what your family is like and all of your relatives and what they think. And like Phyllis said in the film, maybe I'm thinking something that I don't want to be thinking. And uh, what I've found as we've, as we've shown the film around, not only here but in, uh, in other parts of the country, we showed it in uh, California and we showed it in Arizona. And of course we showed it in the Milwaukee Film Festival back in April. Uh, audiences just like you, when the film ends, they're very quiet. And at first that sort of bothered me. I thought, maybe they didn't like it. <laughs> maybe they fell asleep. I don't know. But I think it's because you're thinking about it. And one of the purposes of making the film is so that when it's over, you can turn to the person next to you and say, what was your high school experience? What did you learn in high school? And what was your family like? And you can start those conversations. So if you decide to get together and talk about this more, I think you'll get something out of it too. And remember what you saw. And remember that talking is the best way to solve any problem. Talk about it. And listen. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> to follow that. Um, I think the only thing I could add is one is we have to stop categorizing each other. And this happened to me in government. I worked for two communities for 35 years. And I would hear people say, like, oh, government workers are so lazy. And that would really hurt me because I was not lazy. I worked really hard. So I would take offense to that. So I think... You know, we have to stop categorizing each other. We have to kind of move past fear of differences and celebrate them instead of fearing them. Yeah, I teach my students to have conversations instead of accusations. Like, don't just assume. Um, I'm very lucky to only teach seniors now. <laughs> and <laughs> so um, I can have more progressive conversations of things, but don't assume, stop fearing have conversations, hear each other out. You don't have to agree with each other. You don't have to see eye to eye on every single topic, but to just value each other and what you bring to the conversation because even the person who believes the exact opposite of you brings something to the table. So just having those conversations instead of just assuming and accusing each other constantly of trying to take something. Nobody's taking anything. It's about everybody being at the table. We're going to take a brief time out and be back with more in just a moment. A region with a vibrant arts community is a great place to live, work, and play. My name is Joanne Maria Hazy, and I'm an Appleton artist. Many generous individuals have set up funds at the Community Foundation for the Fox Valley Region to support arts organizations, including photography, music, art shows, programs for kids and seniors, and more. You can set up a fund and support the arts or whatever cause you're passionate about. Learn more at cffoxvalley.org. It's the last half of the school year. That means it's scholarship application time. The Community Foundation for the Fox Valley Region has more than $1 million in scholarships available to high school seniors, college, and non-traditional students. The money comes from scholarship funds created by people, businesses, and organizations who are passionate about education. Applications are open right now. Deadlines begin mid-February. Visit cffoxvalley.org slash scholarships to learn more. My name is Sarah Long. Radlaw, and I've been in the community since 1974, 
and we were only the second black family to move to this community. In Kakana, the turnouts to me were great. I don't know how we'll get more people in the community to come out of the comfort zone to grasp what is going on with diversity. We can all grow from it. I was really glad to hear that the schooling where the teachers need to bring it into the classroom and the history that we were taught is nothing like the history that we have in our past and the history that we are living today. I'm Diane Putzer. I've lived in Appleton for 30 years, but grew up in Wisconsin, in central Wisconsin, in a very white community in about the same era as this initially took place. And it was it was wonderful. And honestly, I was surprised that it happened in Kakana. <laughs> But I guess I would be surprised if it happened in any northern central Wisconsin community, not just Kakana, but any white community that this actually happened. And I give them kudos for people who had the vision 50 years ago. That was audio from some of the audience members who viewed the film at the Fox City's PAC. Now here's more of the story. Um, Amy, something really neat is that uh, out of the five students that are featured in the film, three of them became teachers, one became a social worker, and one became a doctor, all helping professions. So for you as an educator, do you think it's a coincidence that those students went into helping professions after the experience of the exchange? No. I think they were part of the exchange because they have that type of personality that would lead them or maybe it inspired them. I think, and it's actually four people have become teachers because Ian just graduated from school to be a teacher. Hey, so, <laughs> so I going to totally call them out. So I think part of it is in order to go into that field and be successful in any of those fields, you have to be open to other people and other ideas and new ideas. And you need to be willing, if you're going to be successful at it, to put yourself out there. So these young people, thank goodness for their parents or for their you know bravery to do that. It doesn't... I don't think it's coincidence. I think it was meant to be, and I think it's their openness, and maybe this experience drove them further, but um, they're definitely probably better teachers and doctors and social workers because of it. Mm-hmm. And it seems like you've got a lot of stories of the impact that you saw this have on students. Are there any other stories that come to mind? Um, I think one student in particular, it really gave him his voice quite literally. It gave him the power to share his story and speak and and move on beyond some struggles he was having. So, yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, In the film, Dr. Robert S. Smith of Marquette University says, we should not fool ourselves to think that in some magical way we're going to get outside of this thing called race and racism. We are stuck with that. But that's why we need these important stories. That's why we need folks who are brave enough to challenge the color line and racial status quo. Our lives as Americans are so much richer when we engage cross-culturally. Any thoughts or tips of things you've learned over the years about engaging cross-culturally in your life or through being involved in the exchange? And whoever would like to go first can start. <laughs> We're all still learning, so it's okay yeah. to share what you're learning along the way. I mean, maybe I'll go first because, to be honest, I don't have an answer. And I, I think my takeaway is I need to go and reflect. And I hope that everyone in this room just takes some time after seeing this documentary and reflects and just has a hard conversation with themselves of what am I going to do to help change? And I kept thinking, like, someday I want it to be not in white America, I want it to be in America. And what am I going to do to help that change? I don't have an answer, but this, I think, has helped me know that I need to reflect and figure out my role. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've always been involved. With, I, I feel like my whole life I've been involved with diversity, even though I'm from a very white town. I don't know how it all came to be. Um, being married to an individual um, who's not white and having multiracial children definitely has pushed me to even be more motivated, but that wasn't my motivation to begin with. I think it has benefited me greatly personally, but also my students, just that I've 
had so many great opportunities and none of them came to me really. Like I grew up in Kakana. We're pretty white. <laughs> like I'm pretty white, but I, it's more, I had to go get them. And I think just like you said, getting out there and just getting out of my comfort zone and putting myself in these sometimes very interesting situations and, and just being okay with feeling uncomfortable because sometimes I still feel uncomfortable when I'm put in new situations. But I think my life is so much better and my children's lives. My kids were so mad when I quit teaching ESL. They're like, we're not going to any of the parties anymore. What's going on? <laughs> like, you need to find some new students. Like, <laughs> like um, so I think it just, it's made all of our lives so much richer. What do you think, Joanne? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, when I was in the news business, I had to travel all over southeast Wisconsin uh, covering stories. And I would have to talk to people and get to know them very quickly and listen to what they had to say and then write what they said and turn it over into a story, usually the same day. Sometimes I'd have one or two days to work on a story, but usually it was the same day. So I had to talk to people and listen to people very carefully, and get them to trust me very quickly, which um, I think I was pretty successful at. But it helped me when I made the film because I listened to people and took what they said and decided what was best to move the story forward. And I think what all of you might want to think about doing is talking to your friends and neighbors and relatives who are not here tonight, to the ones who said, oh, I don't want to go see that. <laughs> nah, I'm not interested in that. Ask them, why? What are you afraid of? And have some of those difficult conversations and see what you come up with. Our last question. Um, the film ends with a message of hope around the way that young people challenge us to be more inclusive. Dr. Smith said it's their job to make older people uncomfortable. So what can adults or people in positions of power do to support young people to keep pushing us towards a better future for all? And let's start with Joanne. What can you do? Um, support your your young people. Um, and if they come up with some crazy idea of what they want to do or who they want to marry, be open-minded and listen to it. Because they're thinking differently than many of us are thinking, any of us who are in a certain demographic. Uh, and younger people are starting to think differently. They're even starting to change the language. If you listen to the way Gen Xers and Gen Zers talk, and if you listen to the way they talk online and social media, they're starting to develop a whole different type of English language. And you have to understand what they're saying in these languages. And be open to it. I was sort of um, resistant at first. I have two sons, as I said, one's... 29 and one's 30, so they're not millennials anymore. <laughs> but even they uh, are different than I was at 29 and 30. So uh, listen to them and think maybe what they want to do is not necessarily so bad. Maybe it'll turn out all right. But let them support them and let them go do it. I keep having to follow Joanne. <laughs> the only thing I can think um, to add to that is don't just support them, maybe join them. It's like I know I'm looking out at my husband, Mike, and our kids uh, marched in a Mar Martin Luther King, uh, Black Lives Matter march down in Milwaukee to a point where they had like blisters on their feet. We supported them. I'm thinking like, why didn't we go down there and do it with them? So maybe we have to go beyond support and start joining. Thank you. I think through my work with Diversity Club and giving them opportunities and listening, but then also not like making them do things, but encouraging them to do things um, has helped me. But 
I, I feel like I'm, I still want to group myself in that category. Like, I know I'm in my 40s, but I really feel like I'm still young, and I, I'm still pushing old people. Like, like, so I'm kind of having an identity crisis right here. Like, I'm, so I do need to turn it over. That's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to continue to let them be them. Yeah, I think sometimes maybe we just need to get out of the way. Yeah, no, I think that is where I'm at. Like, sometimes I do need to get out of the way because can't do it. Yeah. Well, let me, let me tell Amy something. <laughs> Uh, a couple of times when I told people about doing this film and I said that Amy was helping me do it and helping organizing the visit to Kokana and because she runs a diversity club, I had a couple of people say to me, Kokana has a diversity club? Mm -hmm. We do. Do they have any diversity? (laughs) And I said, well, a little bit. I've seen some. (laughs) Enough to have a club. (laughs) So maybe you need to start some... Grown up diversity clubs and get together and learn about each other. Well, we're going to end our conversation tonight on that hopeful note. So please join me in thanking our panelists for sharing their experience with us. Well, Carolyn, what a privilege for the Community Foundation to sponsor this wonderful event and just to learn from history again. It was really an amazing week, and it sparked such good conversations from everybody who came to see the film, and and Joanne received several standing ovations. It was really neat. Um, Over 1,000 people came out to experience the film at eight screenings, six different locations. Um, And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the partners and sponsors that made it possible. So big thanks to Kakana High School, Kakana Public Library, African Heritage Inc., UW-Green Bay, UW-Oshkosh, Lawrence University, the Fox Cities Performing Arts Center, and the History Museum at the Castle, as well as the sponsors, TDS Telecommunications, Greater Green Bay Community Foundation, Oshkosh Area Community Foundation, and Bank of Kakana. Yeah, thank you to all. Well, that's going to wrap up our program for today. And we've got links to all of the resources that we talked about today. You can find them by going to cffoxvalley.org backslash podcasts and looking for this episode titled Kakana to King 50 Years Later. We hope you enjoyed it. You can subscribe to this podcast and get all of our episodes delivered to you wherever you listen to your audio. We'll see you next time on Voices from the Valley, a podcast of the Community Foundation for the Fox Valley Region. Mm